Good evening, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are two retired New York City police detectives and 9-11 World Trade Center first responders. If you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, you're in the right spot. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, so you'll get all things Duty Ron and Ed Wallace when we go live or upload another video. Hey, tonight, um, Ed and I are going to tackle this holy shiitake mushrooms press conference from today. Rex Hureman, the Gilgo Beach suspect. There's new information that is that was put out today by uh, John Ray, attorney John Ray. Uh, could Asa Ellerup be facing some trouble? Does she have some splaining to do? Ed and I are going to get into that in a few minutes. But before we do, Ed and I want to say thank you to you guys, the Patreon supporters, the channel members, the moderators, the folks who watch the replay and leave us comments, the people who sent us kind words and messages for Ed's wife, who had emergency surgery last Monday, my wife, who was in a rear end car accident on a Northern State Parkway, and me down and out. We got many parts of this team, and Ed with the eczema, he's suffering as well. Uh, how are you feeling today, and how's Margaret, uh, Ed? Well, first and foremost, thank you, everyone, for your well wishes. And Margaret is doing great. She went to the doctor as a follow-up, the surgeon as a follow-up yesterday, and everything is looking good. Uh, she'll have to uh, go you. back to the surgeon uh, next Tuesday and have those uh, crazy staples removed. Um, otherwise, though, we're very, very lucky, um, and uh, things worked out as well as they did. Hey, Ed, before I come back on, I want to ask you what your thoughts are uh, from what you saw today. We're going to get into all of it, and we're going to play some media. And then we have another special, special guest. Our great friend Melanie Little is going to join us in a few minutes. But, Ed, what was your thoughts on the press conference today? I was shaking my head, uh, but I wasn't surprised uh, because John Ray has been jumping up and down all along, bringing us um, – allegations and lots of things about the former police chief and so forth. But I wanted to get your thoughts, Ed, while you're on the screen. Yeah, I thought it was a bit odd, to be quite honest with you, uh, with the uh, police commissioner and um, and John. Um, you know, he's a character. Let, let's be honest, okay? Uh, the clothing, the uh, persona, everything about him is, like, out there. Okay, it doesn't make him a bad guy, but <laughs> it's just – he's just crazy. And um, – but, you know, he, he's come forth with these uh, affidavits and now, you know, the police have to do their due diligence and they're going to have to look at these uh, affidavits and try to um, verify if, in fact, this is the truth. You know, and, it, and it's for me, I don't know about you, Ed, but I think you'll agree with me. Um, in my 30 years of being active and retired, 30 some odd years, I never did see a police commissioner pc uh, somebody in the chat was like what does the pc mean police commissioner rodney harrison uh i've never seen a police commissioner stand side by side by an attorney by an attorney who's representing shannon gilbert and um uh, just it just was for me i just I don't know. I, I just, it was kind of cringeworthy for me, but we did learn a lot of new information. Go ahead. Yeah, it looked, yeah. I mean, I'm wearing my LSU shirt and he, he was dressed like he should have been in a Mardi Gras parade. Right. But uh, I mean, again, again, it goes, uh, that's the way he's been dressing for the 14, 15 years that we've been seeing him in the spotlight, mm -hmm. but he definitely is a strong advocate for these girls. Um, you know, our Gilgo four and arguably we have up to what, 10, 11, uh, sets of remains that potentially now we're looking at, um, you know, they're pointing some fingers here at Rex Hureman for uh, Karen Vergata. And, uh, you know, I, I feel strongly that you know, John Ray is never going to let up on this and more and more people that are feeling comfortable. And I think that a lot of what we saw today was also the police leveraging um John Ray, using John Ray to leverage more witnesses, more people to come forward. And that's that's what we need. You need the help of the public. You need witnesses, people who have been around uh, the various sex workers. The, we heard from that taxi cab driver. We heard from somebody who was involved in a sex swinging club uh, with a on uh, an active police detective, NYPD police officer turned police detective and we're going to get into that in a few hey i wanted to play tonight um two and a half months ago on cuomo 
um, Attorney John Ray came on and made some outlandish statements, made some wild accusations towards Asa Elrup, Rex Sherman's wife. He said that she had knowledge that Rex Sherman was bringing prostitutes, bringing ladies of the night, bringing sex workers, whatever you want to call it. I mean, again, I'll use a Melanie little line. Come at me in the comment section. I, 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 there's no nice way to slice this. But what I'm saying is, is he said that she had prior knowledge and she knew that Rex Sherman were bringing prostitutes home to their Massapequa Park uh, residence. Mm -hmm. I'll play this little piece, Ed. And because swingers, apparently. Swingers. He left a sign in Trapeze, which is a known swinging sex club. In I Manhattan. I personally By his did office. You. Did you know about it? Ed, did you know no, about I did not know about that. Sorry, I, that's not I, my I, lifestyle. I raised my right hand. I knew nothing about it. Um, but the bottom line is, is let's let's play this. This was from two two and a half months ago, uh, and it's relevant to the press conference that we saw today. So for those of you in the chat, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm still trying to get over this cold. But for those of you in the chat have, who have seen this interview and saw today's interview, let us know in the comments here. Let us know in the live chat if you've seen this. Let's let it play. It's just uh, about four minutes. Council joins me now. Councilor, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Again, this is from August 11th of 2023, this summer, just two months ago. You've taken the opportunity. Sure. Um, you said these things very vehemently, but not only do we not have proof of what you're suggesting, the authorities say otherwise. They say that the wife was not in town at the time and that they do not believe the wife was aware of what was going. What do you know that they don't? Well, several things I know, and they said that. I don't say now that they still say that. They said that at the very beginning of this investigation, but other things have developed. Uh, we have a, I have a witness, uh, a very credible witness, who I spent many hours with to interview. Uh, and from that witness, as well as from the circumstances of this case, I know that Mrs. Ellerup is conning the public right now with this press conference and the rest that she pulled off to say that she's in, in need of money. Uh, she is not. And furthermore, she is complicit in her husband's uh, solicitation and use of sex workers in his home over the course of years, many of them. And she, in this tiny little home where she lived and he lived, she was upstairs when he would be downstairs uh, having sex with these prostitutes. And, and now we know, Ed, two, and a, two months ago, he was talking about what he talked about today. So he had yeah. this information in his pocket in mm -hmm. August and was just busting to just get that out there. He did everything but tell the details of what he did, what he did today at that press conference. But this was in August, August 11th, 2023. And uh, he spent enormous amounts of money having sex with these prostitutes. She was upstairs when he would be downstairs uh, having sex with these prostitutes. And uh, sp he spent enormous amounts of money on them. And it was a regular uh, thing that happened. And she's now, after 27 years of marriage, in the age of computers and cell phones, when you know where everybody is at all times, didn't know about what her husband was up to downstairs. That's just nonsense. There's two out of the three hairs that are found on the wrappings of the bodies are hers. That alone puts her in the circle of suspicion. Mm. And if the police come out and said, as they did, well, she had an alibi, well, maybe not once we start to study these cases a lot more carefully. But she was complicit, as you heard the me say. The forensic. Later. Go ahead, sorry. I hear what you're saying, Counselor. I just I just want, no, not at all. I just want to put some meat on the bones of this because it's, you know, it's, it's such a sensitive and damaging thing to say because, you know, you got... Uh, this family that may be as traumatized as anybody else. Uh, what I have heard from not just the uh, perspective of authorities, but the forensic experts is if he had uh, these victims in the house, it's not surprising that you would find DNA from the wife or hair from the wife. Uh, it's her house. Um, but how do you know that she was, as you say, complicit in his activity with sex workers? Who is this witness that you have who would know something like that? I have a witness who has refused 
to identify herself publicly at this time. Uh, she, I just spoke with her very recently, and she is a very, very credible witness. I say that from 40, I pull rank, I guess, is how I'm making the argument. I know that could be a fallacy, but it also could be truthful. And that is that uh, in my 41 years of experience as a trial attorney, a litigator, I, I tested her using the usual test for truth, and she, she tested out fine. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to share. When do the rest of us get to? Pardon me? When do the rest of us get to meet this person and test their credibility and what they have to offer? That's her choice. And she, right now, she's held me back from doing that. However, uh, you know, she does exist and she's real. And it, it stands to reason as well. It's what she tells me is completely consistent with the obvious. And it's the utterly improbable that she didn't know uh, about what his shenanigans right. were in that house for all those years. It's just ridiculous. And she's, right, John Ray, she's out here. I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate you making the case. Anytime you want to come on with her or offer anything else, obviously you should go to the authorities first. I'm not suggesting otherwise. Um, that's what matters most here. Uh, but you got a platform here to make the case of her. What I thought was interesting about this, Ed, uh, is that he did, he was working with the authorities. And John Ray is not, he's not, uh, this isn't his first go around. He's been jumping up and down and being dismissed by the Suffolk County Police Department under James Burke for many, many years. When he would scream and he would jump in, up and down, they would dismiss him like he was some crazy EDP. Uh, and now he's working right alongside the police commissioner. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, Ed. Um, well, I mean, you know, I've read the affidavits uh, of the two people that he's uh, interviewed and and in and has put these affidavits out for uh, and gave apparently to the police commissioner. So now the task force has to investigate their claims. We have to look at their cell phone records to see uh, if we can correlate what's in the affidavits and put them at the locations and the dates and times that the affidavits speak of um, and, and validate their statements. And another thing is that in one of the affidavits, they talk about a, a uh, NYPD a police officer and later turned detective um, who was a part of the swingers group who went out to Rex house. So we got to track this guy down. Right. Okay. I mean, and he can validate whether or not he was at Rex house uh, with uh, this, this other swinger that he get, got the affidavit from plus this young lady, Karen. Um, right. Ed, so, before we get into like the legalities of these affidavits, these sworn affidavits, and we know that the Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison was actually at the second uh, 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 deposition that was taken at the second uh, piece. He was indeed there with this cab driver um, banker during the day, cab driver at night. But I wanted to ask you before we bring Melanie on, I wanted to ask you about Asa Ellerup's hair. Uh, we know yeah. for a fact that the hair was intertwined in uh, the victims here, right? Um, mm -hmm. One one hair, right? One no. strand, or two, I mean two, right? One of his, two of hers. Um, does this put a new um, twist on this case? Does this now take this to a different? I mean, place? you can't take you can't take the hair and then jump to the to the uh, to conclusion that he did. That oh because that uh, the hair is proof that she's complicit. No, that's not a hair is trace transfer evidence. Okay, uh, you know the as I said, we said time and time again. I, you know I joked about it with you that the average human loses seventy five head hairs a day. Okay, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's falling out of our hair. It's falling onto surfaces. As I'm sitting here right now, I'm losing hairs. I'm I'm transferring fibers from my shirt to this cloth. Uh, seat that I'm sitting in, and and I'm taking pieces of this cloth uh, uh, chair that I'm sitting in on my clothing. It's transferring to and my and my pants, and the same thing with the carpet. Um, so it's just tra tra trace transfer evidence. It doesn't mean that she was present at the time that he wrapped these bodies in the burlap and and her hair got caught in the tape and and the bindings and all of that. Uh, it doesn't mean that at all, you, you know. It, but it could. But it, it it does. You can't leap to that conclusion, right? Okay, because as I said, the animal hairs fall out, and then it gets transferred to. I mean, if I if I were to show you my fleece right now, it's filled with Kara's hair, right? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it happens location. all the time. Yeah. And you're in a completely different location, far away from your home. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you too, Ed, do, does, does this now take investigators into a different forensic approach? In other words, can they, and this, I'm asking you these questions because this is like kind of user generated. Will they now look at the remains that they have from these victims a little differently? Will they go back and look at them again to maybe put uh, Rex on again? We're talking about Karen uh, Vergata mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Shannon Gilbert. Yeah, uh, absolutely. They, you know, they're gonna make. You know, I would have a second look at that, and in you know, and if there was anything that was discovered during the um, the body's recovery, and then the body's examination at the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, or even at the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office before it was transferred to the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, right. they should look at anything that was removed or found. That's right. Yes, Eileen, that's correct. Lacard's exchange principal at work with my car. Um, but uh, yeah, they definitely should look at that and then pull those, uh, if they haven't done any analysis or if they haven't, if, if they did find something and um, didn't have it uh, analyzed, yeah, um, go back and look at it again. Or we, you know, you, you, you never know what you're gonna find after a second look or a third look. Yeah, and, and it's very, uh, to me, very strange and very odd that not, uh, that Asa Ellerup did not make any statements publicly, but through her attorney, she stated that they were shocked, that they had no not knowledge of Rex Herman's, um, of her husband's uh, sexual activities. And this completely contradicts it. Um, let's let's bring in our, our, our guest, our good friend, Melanie Little. She's an attorney, uh, tri experienced trial attorney. She has her own YouTube channel, and she's been kind enough to offer her uh, her expertise and her perspective. Uh, Melanie, thank you for joining us and thank you for being patient in the studio. Uh, sure, of course. Hi, you guys. This is a very, um, very interesting day we're having today on Long Island. So I'm um, happy to be here. Now, Melanie, I, I want to jump right in uh, to you with your perspective on what you heard from our friend John uh, John Ray today. I know you had a chance to meet with him at the Suffolk County Courthouse. And um, I mean, are you surprised? Is this a, 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 a wow moment for you? Um, uh, sadly, no. I all along, and I did a show on Karen Vergata. I went back and looked at it about two months ago when they identified or when they publicly said that, that Jane Doe number seven was Karen Vergata. My working hypothesis all along has been that Rex may have been involved in her death as well as the other what they call Manorville butcher cases. But a lot of people were poo-poo-pooing that theory, saying that there's no way, those were dismembered, the Gilgo Four were not dismembered, it could never be the same guy, there's definitely more than one serial killer. And all along I've thought, like, that would just be crazy, because, you know, living here, we're thinking, how could there be two serial killers dumping bodies and body parts in the same location? That's just insane. And what this does today, you know, a lot of people have thought John uh, Ray is crazy. He's a kook. Nobody believes a word he says. But what this does today, this information puts Karen Vergata in Rex Herman's house sure. on Valentine's Day in 1996, which is the exact day that she went missing. The last time her family ever heard from her. And then her legs wash up on Fire Island uh, two months later. They were found in April of 96. And then her skull was not found until April of 2011, 15 years later, which was around the same time that they started finding those other body parts, if you recall, okay. around, you know, Gilgo, Manorville area, torsos, et cetera. So it's a very interesting. Right. And now you got a witness who swore out an affidavit that said they brought her Karen to, that to his house. Mm -hmm. And there was a cop involved. Based off a flyer in a club in Manhattan, close to his office, Ed. Uh, yeah, and it wasn't. And they, in the affidavit, it wasn't clear if whether Rex put that advertisement up in the club or she did. The wife you can't make this up. You can. So again, this all has to get run down because listen, they're swingers. There's more people out there that's swaying with them, okay? And yeah. they're going to come out of the woodwork now, okay, to give their stories. 
And, and I think, uh, and, and, and guys, chime in if you feel that I'm a little off on this, but I really think that Rodney Harrison, uh, the police commissioner, um, was using John, is using John Ray as a fishing device, as like a, a rod and reel in the water with bait on it, because he wants the more people that come and tell the similar stories and are uh, able to corroborate these affidavits, it makes their case stronger. Uh, so I think, in, in fact, that 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 this may be a case of sometimes the media and attorneys can be our best friends and our worst enemies. But in this case, Rodney Harrison, I was so happy to see him uh, shoulder to shoulder with John Ray. And it was uh, it was a victory because, Melanie, you know this and Ed, you know it, too. John Ray has been brushed to the side by Suffolk County higher ups. They actually referred to him as an EDP. They thought that he was emotionally disturbed and that he was wacko, way out. Uh, and now he's finally getting, he, he had the police commissioner sitting in with him as he questioned the cab driver. Melanie, um, wanted to ask you to hear, um, again, we had this whole conversation several weeks ago about the guns. Asa Elrup now is requesting those guns that are legally obtained between her and her husband uh, back. What does this do to the gun? <laughs> Hell to the no. <laughs> She's not getting those guns. Because now, based on these two affidavits, we have learned that he had a gun, right? Just, In each of the affidavits. Just, well, there were four witnesses that came did you, forward. Did you just right. say... Oh, hell no. You did. I said, hell to the no. Yeah. I don't want to copy your, your buzzer there, but I've been saying this all along. No way in hell she was ever going to get those guns back. And I, it, it was shocking to me that they were even considering giving her those guns back. No, according to this affidavit, he used a handgun and pretended mm -hmm. to be a cop. Right. Okay. He, so again, we got to run this all down. You can't just ignore this now. You can't just say, oh, this guy's an EDP. Okay, he's got affidavits that the, the task force has to run the ground now. Yeah, and Ed, you and I said this on a, we did a live stream about these guns, uh, and and we made a mention of it, and we got crucified. People were like, oh, how dare you? She's just trying to survive. She doesn't want the gun. She wants him to go to a F, a firearms dealer, and and and, and she's never going to see the gun. She just wants the money. Um, how do we know that? Nobody knows that. Um, if she's looking to obtain these firearms back, it, it's up to her if they're legally obtained to do what she wants with them. Right. Well, the yeah. guns are part of an estate, right? So she she has legal access to those guns. Uh, well, she has a legal right to them. Let's just put it that way. Right now, she has no access to those guns. Right, they're right. in custody. Yes. So EDP, uh, somebody, Sue asked, she said it differently. She said EDB. It's EDP, Emotionally Disturbed Person. Uh, that's what we were referring to. And now we're not saying that John Ray is an emotionally disturbed person. We're just saying that that's how the police were treating him as he was just a, a wacky cuckoo guy. Um, I all along said to myself, there is some validity to what he's saying because I knew that he was interviewing people who were close in with these sex workers. And when we as police detectives, I, I mean, I, Ed, I don't know how closely you got involved with this, but we always ran into um, scenes, and Ed, you've been to scenes where there are sex workers involved in shootings and homicides. Oh, well, well, yeah, I've been in homicides in, in um, um, let's see, what's the right word now? Uh, don't, don't use the right word, just say it. Whorehouses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so that's what I'm saying is that when, when, when we do these investigations and involve sex workers at whorehouses or whatever uh, establishments where there's illicit activity going on, people wind up getting shot. People wind up getting stabbed. People yeah. wind up getting killed. And then we as detectives now have to interview all the people who are around, who were around, who are at the location. So John Ray is essentially doing the same thing, interviewing people who are friends or co, you know, colleagues or whatever you want to call them, associates. Um, and he was getting all of this cra you know, crazy things that we would think are crazy, but they were in, in fact, in the, in their worlds is normal activity, normal behavior. Um, but we learned so much today. We learned that Rex Hurman is bisexual. He has sex with women and men. And we found that out today 
um, in shocking form with a press conference with the Suffolk County Police Commissioner standing right beside John Ray as he said it. And you know what, Ed, I, I, I looked at Rodney Harrison many different times at different um, press conferences in regards to Gilgo, and he seemed uncomfortable today. Oh, it, oh, you can see it. You can definitely see it. Uh, you know, after you can see it in some of the statements that are that were made, and he was cringing. I mean, he couldn't hide it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. If he could have ran away, he would have ran away. <laughs> he actually tried to end that press conference. Oh uh, yeah. Oh early. yeah. Um, Melanie, I know you homed in mm -hmm. on that. Did you sense that Suffolk County Police Commissioner at certain points felt uncomfortable there? He's, he looked really uncomfortable. And and you know what else? Um, this this whole thing, all of this John Ray stuff, and the reason I met John Ray was because of the James Burke case. So I met John Ray when I was in court for James Burke, who, as you recall, was at Bald Hill um, and got arrested for doing some unsavory, also bisexual things. So you know who else is bisexual? Jimmy Burke. Well, that's and what he said today. <laughs> this, all of this is now going to tie together. I think we're going to see, and people have been saying all along for 20 years that Jimmy Burke may have been involved in this Shannon Gilbert thing. And now you got all these ties that are sort of weaving themselves together. And everyone thought John Ray was crazy, but right. for some reason people come to him and they, yeah. they would rather speak to him sometimes than maybe go to law enforcement because they're afraid. He's not judging either. And apparently this uh, young lady who was a swinger with her um, police uh, lover there that she said she was in love with didn't realize that the, the police officer was by because according to the allegation, he went with Rex. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it, it really things that make you go hmm. And I, I it's 35 minutes. I'm not going to play the whole thing. And I know that you guys have seen this press conference, but I, there are certain parts of it that I do want to play. Um, again, the, the big takeaways or these four people who were from out of state, not Long Island ties, were in Long Island at one point or another, obviously, uh, to give these statements, right? We, we know that uh, the taxi driver slash banker by day, cabby, cab driver by night, she um, is now out of state, but she was interviewed and deposed by John Ray and police commissioner uh, Rodney Harrison. And it was funny to hear John Ray call commissioner Harrison by his wrong last name. Uh, and then he quickly made um, a correction, but he did it twice. He called him Rodney Harris. Now that one, that one portion of her affidavit uh, where Rex pretended to be a cop and, and had a gun, he got out of the car and then went off into the woods and fired the gun allegedly. Um, but also the Suffolk County police responded, right? So you're going to have records from the cabbie dispatch, right? Because she was dispatched uh, by a phone call to that location to pick up a young lady. And Rex got in the car, okay? And she described him. And then the Suffolk County police came by and she had an interaction with him after Rex got out of the car. Right. Um, so you, there's got to be a record there to uh, show the validity of the statements here. 100%. And that's the thing is they are going to have the 911 dispatch to the police, the RMP that went out there, the that's radio right. patrol. Uh, and the police commissioner uh, alluded to that in this press conference. Uh, Deidre, thank you for becoming a YouTube member. We have um, just so many people supporting and we give you so much thanks and praise for the support. We never take it for granted and we thank you for being supporters here on Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. Liz, thank you for the $10 super chat. And she says, my favorite crew on panel. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Darlene Wolf, a great, great friend and a former EMS. Um, she lived in Long Island. Uh, so Darlene, thank you for being uh, a supporter. We greatly appreciate it. Roger still says, who plays Johnny Ray in the movie? <laughs> Johnny Depp. I go for Johnny Depp. Put a oh, little ponytail on him. Uh, um, so I want to also say another thing. Uh, one of our great friends, uh, great uh, supporter of this channel and a moderator, Donna Marie, had surgery today. So we're sending you lots of uh, prayer wishes and healing vibes. Lots of love, uh, Donna Marie. I hope you're feeling better. And the surgery that she had, she described as... Uh, swallowing a bunch of razor blades so um 
I hope you're feeling better, Donna, um, and thank you for everything that you do here. Um, let's go to this press conference. I'm only going to play a little bit of it, um, and if there's any pieces, Melanie, I know that you had mentioned to me um, today by text that you this is something that you do great. You pay attention to details, obviously, uh, but you 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 listen to the reporters' questions, and it was so hard for me. Um, I put in an earbud and I still couldn't get all the questions. And I know Ed has the questions too, that the reporters asked. Uh, but you know, one of them was about Jimmy Burke. Another one was about, um, I believe, um, Asa Ellerup and also the charge, uh, how, how valid are these um, statements that he took? And then there was others. And th so I'm going to lean on you for that, if you don't mind. But let's take a listen to this. Um, by a show of hands in the chat, how many of you have seen this press conference? Again, I'm not going to play it in its entirety because I'll link it in the description so you guys can go over and watch it yourselves. Uh, but just let me know how many of you have seen it. Just let us know. Say, Hi, I've seen it. Me, hands up, something like that. Um, but let's play just a little piece of it, and then we'll come on back. And this is right in the parking lot in Miller Place. My um, my stepmom lives not too far from there, and I know Richella and Pete live close by. We should have Melanie. We, we, if we were really right, we would have sent them over there, and they could have they could have gotten this live on on uh, on scene. All right, here it goes. No, oh, before we start, so Newsday's over a few things. I don't know. All right, when you're ready, you tell me, and I'll tell you I'm ready. Yeah. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. We're here today because new information has been uh, has arisen in this case from witnesses who were so far unknown. Those witnesses, of which there are four, have given us statements, two of whom have given us affidavits regarding this case, regarding Rex Uriman and Shannon Gilbert and Karen Vergata. Before I talk about them, first, I want you to be aware that here stands the commissioner, as you know, with me. And up until now, we have not made it known to the public that we have been working together on this case steadily since the time that I came to know Commissioner Harris a year ago, February. Uh, we, up until that point, the police department was very resistant to receiving any kind of evidence or information from my office, from what I was doing. That all changed significantly when, uh, Commissioner Harris stepped in and we, uh, began to collaborate and we've collaborated ever since that collaboration has had fruit. And that fruit, at least, are the witnesses I'm going to be talking about today, as well as other evidence and information which we have shared together and with the police department, uh, and this, uh, therefore with the task force. So it is true to say that our cooperation has given rise to more substantial, valuable evidence in the entire case of the Long Island serial killer. So with that in mind, I'm very pleased that, that Commissioner Harrison has seen fit to open his mind and, and to do what I'm suggesting has been done, uh, contrary to all those who have come before him. And he's approaching this case in the right way. He's the right man for the job, and he's done his job well. As to the witnesses, did anybody notice that he said thank you to him there? Did, did you guys hear that? I thought that was classy. Um, he said very low. The very first time I listened to it, I didn't catch that. But <clears throat> these two have a good working relationship, it seems, uh, for face value here. As to the evidence, in no particular order of importance, because so much of it is important. I have stood as a beacon to, as a civilian beacon, to the people who are involved in this case to come and talk where they didn't want to approach the police out of fear, out of apprehension, 
uh, out of a natural, some in some cases, a natural distaste for the police department because of the work these people were in. So they would then come to me and speak to me and I would interview them and we would then cooperate, I, them and the police department. And so with that in mind, the first two witnesses I'm going to talk about are uh, both of them uh, are not Suffolk County residents. I should point out that uh, we obtained from these two affidavits, their names will go unmentioned. Their, their names are blotted out of the affidavits, but the affidavits will be available to you right after the press conference. As to the first one I'll talk about, this is a witness who has every reason to have no bias, no interest in the case whatsoever. She was not a sex worker, is not a sex worker. And instead, back in the 90s, in the 1990s, she was what is known then and now as a swinger. She would have a sex partner and they would go to certain sex clubs in New York City where they would switch partners with other people of like kind. One of the most important places that they would go was called La Trapeze on West 27th Street in New York, right near uh, uh, Rex Uerman's office. And this was a notorious place for swapping, for switching partners. Uh, and sometimes several hundred people at a time would be involved in this place in its heyday. Its heyday was in the late 90s, uh, right at the time that uh, Karen Brigada is involved in this case. In this situation, this particular woman was uh, dating a police officer from New York City who was in narcotics, a detective, and uh, they would go to these, these switchy clubs, these swapping clubs. Switchy clubs. At a certain time, at, at or about Valentine's Day oh of 1996, I believe, uh, the, the, uh, the couple went to La Trapeze and I think it was on the wall at La Trapeze where an advertisement wa uh, was placed to go to a house in Massapequa Park for partying, for switching, for swapping. She went with her boyfriend uh, out to Long Island. But before they went, her boyfriend picked up a, a woman in New York, in the city, who had apparently just gotten out of jail. And she was disheveled and hungry. And she was a sex worker. We don't know the details yet of how he came to know her, but he knew her. And she came in the car with the two of them. They went to Massapequa Park. Before they got there, they stopped at a gas station. And the girl who was with them expressed some apprehension about where they were going and why. Uh, that was all wiped out when it was pointed out that he's a police detective. So don't worry. No problem. They ended up going to Rex Uriman's house. In the house was the wife of Rex Uriman and uh, Rex Uriman and the, the, the other girl. The other girl. I'm going to stop it right here just for a second because I want to put us back on. Uh, Ed, we played, before we added Melanie on into the show, we played the Cuomo piece. And Melanie, I know you saw it. You were in the studio. This is him tying it in. Uh, mm -hmm. for those of you who are in the chat that might not be following it very closely, in August of 2023, he went on News Nation and went to other news stations and did this um, and, and had this discussion where people were like, oh, my God, he's accusing Asa Ellerup of knowledge that Rex was bringing prostitutes to their home. How dare him? But here, this is today, Ed and Melanie, him saying and laying the groundwork down for exactly what he talked about two months ago. Right. But again, 
a lot of this information can be verified. And like she said, he just got out of jail. Well, we got to search the records around that time about Karen getting out of jail, if that was in fact the case. Um, stopped at a gas station. Well, let's see if we can verify that. Let's get the names of these individuals, check the cell phone records. We'll see if they're pinging in these areas that um, they said to have stopped at and were traversing to, and if their phones were pinging at Rex's house. Right. And and that's what Rodney Harrison has, he's up against. Because before he brings this to the district attorney, and Melanie, I'm going to go to you on this, they need to have a tight case. They can't go there with just loose facts, correct? Correct. But he also said that he's he brought Rodney Harrison in two months ago. So when he was doing those press conferences, they've apparently been working together quietly. I mean, that's what I gleaned from that press conference. And just the fact that Rodney Harrison is standing next to him during that press conference gives John Ray so much more credibility. I would have to think, and you guys let me know from a law enforcement perspective, perspective don't you think they've vetted all this information before he's standing next to him at this police at this press conference today? I 100 percent agree. Yeah. I mean, if he had this information for two months, that they they have dotted their eyes and crossed their t's now, and there's so there is some validity here. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't be standing there. Right. There is no way. And I, and I said this before we started uh, in the beginning of the show, in my 30 plus years of active and retired service, I've never seen a police commissioner stand next to somebody who's re representing families of murdered victims uh, like this. So this today was the first for me. I don't know about anybody else. Maybe this goes on in other parts of the United States, but not here in the Northeast. You do not see that. You don't see a ex police executive that came from the NYPD. He, again, Ed, he was chief of detectives in the yeah. NYPD, largest police department in the United States, uh, the most detectives, uh, arguably, uh, yeah, most detectives in, in, in any metropolitan police department in the United States. This man is not going to stand shoulder to shoulder with him and say, yeah, I'm working with him. I sat in on these on one of these interviews. So we have the the two affidavits. Um, I'll link it in the description. You can go to a, a, a Google Drive and check it out. Um, I have them. I just I just feel that it would be boring if we posted them up and read them because what John Ray is saying here, um, Melanie and, and Ed, is almost word for word what's in those affidavits. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, it puts Karen Vergata in Herman's house in 1996. This, 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 for people who live on Long Island, this has been going on here for 27 years. Right. And it also states that she ran out of the house naked as the officer and the swinger were leaving Rex. Yeah. And they left her there. He's just playing a game. Let's let, I'm only going to let this part play the first part. We're not going to listen to the second half with the taxi driver, even though that's, uh, also pretty compelling uh, and, and very shocking. But this, this really, this first thing that he goes to here with the with this these people from the city and the police detective cop, NYPD. I can't wait to to hear if this guy gets called in. I'm sure that he will. He's definitely named. There's no doubt he's named. Right. And they identified him and they validated that he was, in fact, a detective in narcotics and he's a police officer in Prospect Park. Yeah, he's been taken in and questioned. No, no doubt. Absolutely. No. Well, who we believe to be Karen Vergata. Detective. So don't worry. No problem. They ended up going to Rex Uriman's house. In the house was the wife of Rex Uriman and... Uh, Rex Uriman and the, the, the other girl. The other girl who we believe to be Karen Vergata. She, this girl, disappears downstairs at the house. Rex Uriman disappears. And according to our witness and other witnesses I've talked to, when men are swingers with their, their partner, very often they switch sexually. They go back and forth between male and female. And so Uriman leaves the main floor and disappears either into another bedroom or downstairs. It's not clear. And the witness talks to Rex's wife. She doesn't 
want to have sex like she had expected uh, to occur because our client believes because our client is an African-American woman. And Uriman didn't like that. Uh, Ellerup, rather, didn't like that. So there was no sex between them, as was originally planned. Instead, the sex is between Uriman and the other man. At some point, the witness goes looking for her partner and is kind of upset that he doesn't emerge. He emerges, and finally, they leave, and kind of in a hurry. But when they leave, as they're leaving, the witness points out that she could see in the window, looking out, the girl the, that had come with them. And she says to her, her uh, driver, her, her partner. This is what I found a little odd. Ed, I don't know if you caught on to this in Melanie. Yeah. Now starts referring to him as a driver. Right. Uh, that part, again, my detective sense, my, I didn't like that. He's now making reference to the driver, uh, not her partner. She said in that affidavit she was in love with him. They had a relationship, and he's mm -hmm. referring to him as a driver. So that was a negative to me. I think he may be, you know, like when you have a lot of cases in your head, you start confusing your cases. And he's also got Shannon Gilbert involved in this too. And she had a driver and maybe I, he's just yeah, in I, his head said the wrong thing. I don't know. Could be. We... Could be. But What are we doing? Are we taking her? And the partner says, don't worry. They're just playing a game. She stays there. No problem. With that, the girl runs out of the house naked and is running in front of the garage. And now the witness says, hey, shouldn't we be taking her? Something's wrong here. And the driver tells her, no, nah, they're just playing a game. Leave it. And they leave. She never hears about the incident again. She distinctly remembers Uriman. She also had intercourse with Uriman that, that same day. And... Uh, she kind of you know buries it, it forgets about it. Until on TV, she sees the picture of Karen Vergata. And she recognizes her and said, that's her. And she recognizes Rex Uriman. And so she comes forward, forward and I meet her. I interview her at great length. Um, I also had the police department uh, we, we arranged for detectives to interview her and I found her story. I interviewed her for three times for a total of nine hours. And, uh, I found her story to be credible. She also mentioned that Rex would go out in the backyard and start a fire at one, two o'clock in the morning in a big barrel that was outside in the back. And she was worried about that too, that it would attract police. Anyway, she seemed credible she appears to be credible, and she was willing to sign an affidavit to that effect, and that affidavit will be available to everybody. In, and in the details I've just told you, you will find there. The second witness. Okay. So, again, this information to me is very, very important when it comes to putting these cases together, but it's not a slam dunk by any means. Definitely right. not a slam dunk. Now in the Cuomo interview, he said that he, um, he tested her uh, truthfulness. Really? Yeah. So I'm wondering if he gave her a polygraph. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. No, no, there was no questions asked in regards to that. And that would have been a great question to ask him uh, if he polygraphed any of these four, because again, he, he mentions four. Um, I want to fast forward to the part where um, police commissioner Harrison starts talking because that's where it gets interesting. Uh, and then the questions start coming. Uh, and towards the end of it, he tried to end the conversation once it turned to James Burke. And I know a lot of our YouTube detectives, internet detectives, whatever you want to call them, cyber sleuths or whatever, are going to be picking that part, uh, picking that apart, pretty pretty strongly. 
uh, but it didn't seem like he wanted to get into that line of questioning. And a little bit to his defense, I would say that um, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing uh, that he was not there for that. Uh, but they, but they were certainly going to go into that direction. Did you pick up on that, Melanie? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Ed, um, and, and I can't blame him for, for wanting to end it at that point because they did answer quite a bit of the questions. Uh, but I'm going to go not to that, but towards the end of this. Um, there's only another six minutes of this. I'm not going to play it all. Okay, here we go. Information presented about Karen Bergata. Yep. She's the first known victim of the serial killer. Does this lead you to make Rex Spearman the prime suspect in her murder in 1996? So, Melanie, did you did you get all of that or what she said? I think she was asking him about Karen Regatta and does this make him the prime suspect of her murder? Yeah, is this... Uh, this is Mary Murphy. Is this the first question? Because that... I do not... Have, oh, hang on a sec. It's the first question because that's when John Ray is done. I'm going to... Okay, gonna... she said uh, some information was presented about Karen Vergata. She was the first known victim of the serial killer. Does this lead you to believe that Rex Heerman was the prime, is the prime suspect in her murder in 1996? The information presented about Karen Vergata. Yep. She's the first known victim of the serial killer. Does this lead you to make Rex Heerman the prime suspect in her murder in 1996. You know, I don't want to uh, make Rex Human the prime suspect. I, I will say this, and uh, I'll share this over and over again. Uh, the creation of the task force uh, got us into a good place of being able to identify Rex for uh, three of the uh, sex workers that were discovered, and we're looking very good uh, for the fourth one. Uh, but we also added two more investigators to the task force to take this type of information in and to pursue it, to follow it, to see if this is credible. Uh, that's very important. And that's why uh, people don't understand. When I first came into this position, uh, I sat down with John Ray, uh, myself and the members of the task force to have that conversation about information that he may have. And, and let's make sure we're uh, putting a, a dragnet out there regarding any information that's coming to us. That's why I'm going to continue my partnership with John. And if people have a reluctancy to come forward to law enforcement and they want to go to John Ray, then it's important that we take this information and then we follow forward with uh, furthering the investigation. So I'll, uh, it's still an ongoing investigation. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So she further questioned him, do you believe that this is credible information? He didn't say yes or no. He said it's an ongoing investigation, which is the proper answer, right, Ed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't well, tip, it, tip your hand now. This, we have the information, we're working it, and uh, we'll see where it leads us down the road. You were saying to us earlier that you're going to leave no stone unturned and the fact that there possibly were affidavits that you can use to possibly find future victims. That I, absolutely, and that's, and that's a very good question, and... So that one was about additional affidavits to find future victims, and that's the Jane, um, the Asian male, Peaches, the baby. That I think that's what they were trying to re refer to there. Uh, that's why I stand here today with John Ray. Uh, you know, people uh, don't want to use our Crime Stoppers hotline, and they feel a lot more comfortable going to John Ray or, or anybody else. You know, I, I want to make sure that people understand uh, that we have a job here as law enforcement, as the Suffolk County Police Department, to make sure we investigate every single uh, complaint or interest in this case. Uh, make sure that we look under every single stone to see if there is any connection to Rex Sherman or if there is a connection to somebody else that may be involved with the bodies that were discovered on Ocean Parkway. So we could go about. Uh, so she asked if he knew of the affidavits before today. About a month and a half, uh, two depending months. on two months. Depending. So that puts it right into the time frame of when he went on to Cuomo, which was August 11th. So, yeah, he said a month and a half, two months. Depending on each one, 
uh, for one of the affidavits, I was actually sat down with the, the person myself. That just shows you my vested interest in it. Uh, you know, listen, this is something that's very important to me. Uh, I'm going to continue to grind to make sure anybody that had an interaction with our defendant, Rex Sherman, is held accountable in this case. The uh, the livery cab driver. The taxi cab driver, yeah. That's the one with Shannon Gilbert. That's the one. So he asked, uh, she asked, who did he sit down for, number one or number two? And she said, number two, the cab driver, Shannon Gilbert interview. I'm with Shannon Gilbert, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, what year was that? 2007 or nine? 2009. The, the, taxi the taxi driver is 2009, the fall of 2009. And she is not absolutely certain of the time frame, but that's where it approximates. And that's where, Mary, that's where we're going to make sure we're doing our job and trying to nail down time frames, look at uh, radio runs and other things Just that what you can said, help Ed. us kind of pinpoint uh, if there is any credibility to these complaints that come forward, that came forward. And the commissioner did send two detectives to interview the other witness with me. Uh, which, which we did already in, 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 uh, at length. John or Peter, um, did any of these witnesses explain why they didn't come forward before now? Yes. It, was it immediately when they saw Rex Sherman's picture? Yeah, it was certain. So, so they asked any reason why these victims chose to come forward now and not before? Uh, and was it, and she further, she further stated, was it, after they saw Rex Sherman's picture or the victim's photos. Because don't forget, Karen Regatta was just identified through, um, you know, the genetic genealogy, and um, that was the Ortham Labs down in Texas. Um, and then we had her, her real picture. Uh, but before that, she was Jane Doe number seven, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Really a, a question we had to ask, uh, you know, we have to ask many, many questions to test credibility. And, and I'm not saying that people wouldn't necessarily lie, although they might, but that they don't remember or they mix up facts with other other situations. We had to test all of those things. And so we had to test that, too. And uh, in the one case with the uh, the witness with the swapping, she she just she, it bothered her that they left behind this girl. But. She had no other reason to think anything of it until she saw this. She actually broke down. She couldn't believe it when she saw the picture and knew that girl. Uh, and that, that happened there. With the uh, taxi driver, the taxi driver did report it. The taxi driver, uh, back in when this originally happened, she, she talked to her. Uh, she, her cousin was a cop. She spoke to her family. She spoke to other taxi drivers. She told a lot of people about it. And then she did contact Crime Stoppers and, and report it and actually talked to them twice, but nobody called her back. So that's before, long before the commissioner was involved. Terrible. So she did come forward and she said, well, you know, she, when, when it got uh, reactivated, the issue, then she called me. Okay. Oh, I didn't so, hear that. You know, did, did you catch that, Mel? This is the one where uh, she, she said, did you find, Commissioner, did you find the witness credible, the one that you sat with? The way John explained it, and you got to just kind of take this into context, uh, she doesn't have a, a stake in the game. She's a um, cab driver at night, uh, had a profession during the day. You know, she's not necessarily from this neighborhood. So, you know, this little things like that kind of piqued my interest. And uh, once again, is this, you know, why did she come forward and uh, her role and story and everything? It's, it's something that we need to take a closer look at and we need to make sure we're investigating it. And that's why the task force will stay in place. Uh, that's why we, we added more manpower to it. Uh, we're going to continue to work with our law enforcement partners and uh, see if there is any nexus to um, uh, to our defendant Rex Sherman, or once again, like I said before, if there happens to be another subject out there, we'll we'll look at them as well and see if we can hold them accountable. And it was reported that uh, 
you guys were honing in on Valerie Mack and Karen Vergato in this case, is this a Shannon Gilbert to the list of those two women that you're intensely looking at, you know, their personal lives and whereabouts? Well, it's, it's all the uh, bodies I've discovered. Let's not rule out. So he asked about Valerie Mack, right? She asked about Valerie Mack. Valerie um, Mack, yeah. And she said, does that, and Karen Vergata, does that add Shannon and Gilbert to the list of victims that you're looking at to be connected to human? Peaches, the Tyler, the, the Asian male, I, you know, those were the names uh, that I shared with Tony, but it doesn't mean that uh, we're not continuing to look at all the bodies that were discovered there. But uh, the ones right now that uh, J John has when it comes to uh, Ms. Regatta and when it comes to Ms. Gilbert are the ones that we're going to take a closer look at and see if they're connected to our defendant. Any update on the uh, fourth uh, victim? Uh, yeah, so I, I know our district attorney should be doing announcement uh, real soon and uh, he'll keep you advised regarding if there's a, a nexus uh, to the uh, to the DNA that was recovered and if there, if there is a match. So this witness wanted to say that Rex had sex. They were alluding to um, um, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, yeah. We called the woman who think that we forgot us and this other man, a North Coast detective. So knowing that indicates he's probably potentially bisexual, does that make him more of a leading suspect in an Asian male? Listen, any, any that was a great question by um, uh, Murphy. Um, she said, because we've now figured out that Rex Ehrman is a bisexual, does this make him a suspect for the Asian male? So that was that was good reporting. And and after we do this, Ed, I want to go to you for uh, the forensic part of this, um, just to tell the audience what they have to do here um, and, and how it all ties together with the Suffolk County Crime Lab and Ortham Labs down in Texas because people are talking about how hard they're working on this. Um, so that's how I want to kind of wrap this up is to give your um, your forensic um, uh, perspective. I think it's possible, uh, but once again, is this, this is something that we need to investigate. And I'm sure everybody can understand uh, there's a judicial process still going on. There's uh, ongoing investigation. Now that this information has been provided to us, I can only share but so much. Uh, but I will uh, reassure everybody here, we are not done with this investigation. I want to make sure that that's very clear. John, can I ask you um, is James Burke involved in the case? Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Ed, what did she say there? James Burke. She, she said, said John. She directed it to John, too. John, is James Burke involved in any of these cases? Did you see the way he must have known, you know, like he knows all these reporters, but his face, watch how he lights up with like a big smile and he waves to her. Like, yeah. And, and watch the commissioner like back away. This is it. This is, this is the end of it. This is where he actually tries to put a, he tries to put a plug in it and say, okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That's all. Here we go. Well, I can't say he is and I can't say he is. So we'll make sure that that's very clear. Well, I can't say he is, and I can't say he's not. I, he certainly reactivated interest in himself by what he did up on Bald Hill, uh, which, by the way, you should probably you probably know that it's a notorious place for men picking up other men. I've represented several clients from that hill for that very same thing, and Burke was a street smart cop. He's even noted in his disciplinary record for being extremely street wise. He would have known what. Ed, should we get Dr. G explains for the body language? <laughs> oh, yeah. Commissioner on this? Because he turns away. Like he was. He, he, like, he, can't, he can't find a place to jump <laughs> into quick enough. He's trying to get to the bushes. Not in these bushes where I can just jump. Men picking up other men. I've represented several clients from that hill for that very same thing. Look, and he's looking Burke around. was a street smart cop. He's even noted in his disciplinary record for being extremely street wise. He would have known what goes on up on that hill, but he also would have known the risk he was taking and he took it anyway. Burke, the risk taker emerges, first of all. And second of all, Burke, who is interested in men emerges, which is very much consistent with what I had said for years that he was cross-dressing when he was with some of my clients including uh, 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 Lorita Rickenbacker, uh, and that he had that other interest. 
do, the, do those other interests matter? Sure, they do. If you're going to look at the old police department and see w- why did Burke get to where he went so easily, uh, yeah. could it be oh, that boy. it's sexual in, improprieties on higher levels than we originally thought? It's something that should be looked into. We don't know. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm out of here. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, where's his driver? His driver should have stepped in and said, boss, we got a job. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so go go back and listen to that. Melanie, did you did you write down what they were saying at the end there? Before? Yeah, the last question was, just for cl- cl- clarification on the second witness, the cab driver, are you saying that she contacted police initially when Shannon Gilbert went missing, when her picture emerged in, and did she see, or did she only contact you after seeing Rex Heerman? Because remember, they said that she called Crime Stoppers twice, and that's why I thought it was so interesting that Rodney Harrison said in the middle of this, before they brought that up, you know, some people, if you don't want to call Crime Stoppers, you can call John Ray. Because right, the people right. who call Crime Stoppers, we don't return their calls. Because or at least back when they, these calls were made, we didn't follow up on that. So, Oh, my God. Interesting. Um, yeah, so, again, I'll link that in the description. But I wanted to, again, go to Ed. You know, this opens up the forensics, not just with, like you said, the cell phones, the, the any type of tracking data. Now it goes back to 1996 and beyond. But really, we know 90, 1996 mm-hmm. – there's limited, I think we had those Nextel Direct Connects back in 96. Um, there wasn't a lot of the same technology that we, we're used to today, but there were still cell towers and tracking devices in these phones. But I, I wanted to get, because people are going to ask these questions, and I figured well, let's nip it in the bud here now. The forensic labs, they are going to, and we we touched on it in the middle of this, they're going to go back and look at stuff. Could you just give the audience a brief overview of what is entailed in time uh, and, and forensic detective work here? All right. Well, first of all, they're going to try to look at um, the unidentified that we still are have outstanding here and see if forensic genealogy can play uh, a significant role in it. Now, remember, our the lab in Texas, uh, according to their own literature and their own statements they give, they only take cases that they know they're going to get an identification from. Okay, Awesome lab you're talking about. Yes, yes. So um, hopefully they can look at the other uh, unidentified uh, people in this case and see if there's the possibility of them extracting genetic profile for genetic genealogy to help identify um, the peaches, Asian male, and baby. Right. Um, and, you know, and that will go a long way uh, to furthering this investigation. And then once we identify who they are, then we can then bring up their social media history. We can bring up uh, emails, texts, uh, whatever was going on in their lives. Um, and then we got to find out when – if anybody reported these people missing and uh, so to get the time frame of when they went missing uh, to understand the possibilities of when they were murdered. Okay. Um, Again, the bodies were recovered. The bodies were brought back to the Suffolk County medical examiners. Hopefully there was some proper uh, examination done of the bodies. And um, if there was any forensic evidence on the bodies of, of the decomp bodies and what was recovered, you know, foreign hairs and fibers, anything like that, uh, you would think that if there were um, hairs and fibers, say, of uh, Rex or his wife or even the dogs, Rex dogs or Rex children uh, right. pre- present on um these uh, remains, then they would have known that already. Uh, you would think that that would have been discovered already. So, but I find it interesting though, you know, that, you know, initially I remember when we were talking about the case that people said, oh, the, the first bodies, you know, they were dismembered. And so that can't be Rex. Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. He just may have changed his MO, his modus operandi. He may have found out, oh, this is too hard work, man. I don't have to do this kind of uh, difficult work and and dismember the bodies and I, and went you know I can just you know wrap them up in this camouflage burlap duck burlap and then and put them in the uh, fields here. How strongly will they start looking at uh, 
potential ties with Asa Elora. And I don't want to, you know, keep prying on this, but, you know, now this press conference puts a new twist on her potential involvement or knowledge of what Rex was doing. If this in fact is true, that she knew that he brought people home and participated and was participating, this, this changes everything. No. Yeah, it, it definitely does. I mean, I don't know how thoroughly they looked at her cell records or, or her um, social media, her emails and so forth to see uh, what her involvement is uh, now. But this again, all of this sheds new lights, uh, new light towards her. Uh, um, you know, was she a willing participant or was she just doing it um, to appease Rex? Because apparently um during the af- the affidavit says uh, that she was afraid of Rex. Right. Okay. Right. So, Melanie, I wanted to ask you too quick too before we wrap up. Um, I heard at the end of this that John Ray said that he was deposing. Um, I believe. Oh, I had his name written down here. Oh, was it Doctor Brewer or Joseph no, Brewer? Joseph Brewer. Now, uh, Joseph Brewer was the. Um, the John who summons Shannon Gilbert out to his home. Uh, Mm -hmm. The doctor Hackett um, wasn't mentioned, but he mentioned that he finished deposing him today again. Right. Yeah. That's in the civil case that he has on behalf of Shannon Gilbert's family. Yeah. Which, uh, which is interesting, but um, listen, uh, you know, the house where this all happened this was the house that Herman grew up in. He bought the house in 1994. So all of these timelines are starting to add up, right? You've been to that house, Ron. <laughs> You've driven by that house for us, and we've seen it. Uh, he bought that house in 1994. He marries Asa Ellerup in March or April of 1996. So if this swinger party happened at his house in February, Valentine's Day of 96, makes perfect sense that she would be there. Perhaps they were living together. Uh, even if they were not yet married, they were were to be married two months later. So, you know, this puts her into the whole swinger community. Somebody said in the chat, a couple of people said, I threw up a little bit in my mouth. And I, I got to say, that I'm right there with you. I feel like this is an, an episode of Saturday Night Live where we're all three of us are in a skit and we just can't stop laughing. It's well, like, it's, 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 it's terrible. It is terrible, but you know I know this is a very serious topic and everything. But when you when you start getting into these uh, crazy lifestyles and and the sexual deviancy in this world here, all I can, you know all I hear in the background is like the theme song from Austin Powers keep going off in my mind. Wait, how many people have Googled La Trapeze today? Not me. I don't oh, want that in my search history. But. Yeah, you definitely want to do that. No, you don't want to do that. Um, but yeah, it puts a whole nother light on this case and people, again, who, there was many people who were supportive uh, and being supportive of Asa Ellerup and saying that she was just a victim of, you know, being around Rex Herman, a controlling narcissistic sex freak. And we also got confirmation today that he was, um, calling and contacting 20 plus times a day these these uh, sex workers and having sex with them 20 plus times a day um and and that fits in the bill of what the police commissioner and the district attorney tierney was saying that they were afraid and they had to take him down because he was buying those burner phones to do what to contact these sex workers mm. and this all ties in to current day of what they were doing when they were investigating him they took him down because they were worried he was going to kill somebody again because he was trying to reach out to these these sex workers yeah Um, there's there's a question in the chat about why aren't they questioning the wife uh right now well she's lawyered up okay so uh and she may have gave some statements in the beginning with the lawyer present but i doubt she's going to be talking anytime soon right yeah um, so let's go to the chat. I want to just say thank you to everybody for being civil in the chat. And I know that I see a lot of people talking about movies and trying to have some fun with this, but you know, this is, again, this is when you look at it, we're talking about real people with, you know, families and, uh, we're trying to get, you know, the police department is trying to get justice for these, for these folks. And, um, as much as we want to, you know, put a little bit of a twist on it at the, at the end of the day, there are real live, uh, you know, people that are, 
are waiting for justice for their loved ones. So this is where we're at. And I'm sure that we're going to hear more in the following days. John Ray is going to be vocal. He's going to be out there again. He's going to talk. Um, you know, he's gone on podcasts and I've seen him on interviews. I looked before we went live here tonight and I saw that he was talking with several other YouTube uh, content creators to t- talk about his, his um, you know, the case and, and what he's doing. Uh, he's not exposing his cards but he's talking. Uh, we're going to keep following this thing. And I want to thank Melanie Little and Ed Wallace for taking out the time here tonight. Uh, again, we this this is a lot of moving parts. A lot of things are going to be happening. And you're going to get some people that are make, make a lot of different claims and misinformation being exchanged. But what you're going to get here is the facts. I'm going to link the two affidavits in the description you guys can go and read it and check it out it's really the same as what john ray said today um and i, I want to go to ed for uh, final thoughts here well like i said this is very interesting developments uh let, let's uh let the task force run this down um i'm sure by now they have identified this cop and have uh, brought him in for questioning or talked to him uh about about this case um and I think that would get us one one step closer to to um, charging uh, Rex with Karen um, uh, death, and and that's also that's also going to change the timeline now, okay? And uh, so this that's interesting. And then if he did if if he um, dismembered Karen, so then he's probably involved with those other dismemberments that are found in the same area, so. Uh, I think this is all very interesting, and hopefully we can get justice for all of these victims. Amen to that, Ed. Uh, Melanie, I wanted to go to you on the attorney's perspective. Wow, this is really interesting. Um, You know, John Ray has been uh, squawking for years and years about the Suffolk County Police Department being uh, potentially involved in this and the reason for the investigation being called off because James Burke may have been involved in this. A couple of people were imprisoned. It's very interesting to me that of the four witness statements that they talked about today, three of them involved police officers. And you know that I back the blue 100%. But the first one had a police officer at Rex Herman's house. The second one had a police officer... um, who Bond. came, the car drove up, right? Right. To the taxi driver. And then I think the third one, a police, police officer came over. So in three of these four witness statements, a police officer was mentioned. If there was a police officer that was involved in this, who knows, like what could explode next? It's just like, hang on to the edge of your seats. He's been talking about these parties in Oak Beach, these sex parties in Oak Beach that so many people were involved in. Um, and he said other witnesses come forward saying that they also had sex with James Burke at these sex parties. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all falls together. But like you said, uh, Ron, in the end, this is all about uh, the victims. And now we're connecting more victims to this. So, you know, prayers go out to Melissa Bartholomew, the families of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Karen Vergata, and Shannon Gilbert, who seem to all be perhaps victims of here men. So we'll see yeah. where this goes. Absolutely. You guys said it perfectly. And um, we're going to continue to, you know, follow this and see where it leads us. Uh, Ed and I are going to, you know, keep a close eye on it, but we have a lot more to talk about. There's so many different cases that are developing as we speak. Uh, look, Natalie Holloway, we, that was breaking today with a, a confession coming in from that piece of garbage now that is going to be shipped to back off to another country to serve, what, 38 years or whatever it is for uh, another murder. So there's so much to talk about. Suzanne Morphew, Ed and I are going to try to break it down. If Forensic Friday is coming up, uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to do it this Friday, uh, but maybe next Friday. I'm still down and out, not feeling great. But uh, thank you guys for all hanging in here with the questions and the comments. If you're not yet subscribed, please consider subscribing to Ed and I. Subscribe to Melanie's channel. I'll link it in the description. Uh, Also, give it a thumbs up. Share it onto social media platform and um, engage with us. We love to have that conversation afterwards, especially Ed. He scans the chat like... 
like there's no tomorrow. He's on it and he answers your questions. Ed, right? You love to go back and forth with the people. And I know you do the same thing, Melanie. So oh, yeah. yeah. Totally. They have great questions and uh I love it. Yeah. So, and that's what makes it a great community. It's live interactive stuff. But once we're done with the live, it's a chance for you to get to us in the comments. So definitely hit us up in the comments. I want to just say thank you to all of the replay viewers, the people who give super thanks, who leave us coffee uh, tips and all kinds of stuff. And there's so many people who gave super chats and gifted memberships. Galen gifted out memberships and a whole bunch of others. And uh, Liz and Deidre, uh, Roger and sister uh, Carol Ann Clark is out of the hospital. Thank God for that. Thank you for the super, super love from sister Carol Ann Clark said first time i caught you live and i'm out of the hospital i'll have to find uh that on your chats what does none of why does none of this surprise you yeah well thank you again uh on behalf of crime time with duty ron and ed wallace we're going to wish you a good evening and prayers and strength to these victims families thank you guys we'll talk to you soon peace and love from ed wallace and crime time with duty ron Stand by for a message. What is it? The cop team? We got to redo it, right? It's not right. The, the cop team is not in the same right order. Well, who, who who can do that? If anybody wants to step up and help us. But yeah, that's our cop team. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Melanie. Peace, guys. Mm -hmm.